Hi, y'all. Welcome to another great Live at Five session with the LSU Ag Center. Today, we have a really special guest on, Associate Professor Ron Strahan, and he's here to talk to us about lawn and garden weed management. We have had a lot of questions about crabgrass and about um, weeds in your garden. So, Ron, um, what's your background? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself first off? Well, grew up on a farm in North Louisiana, small farm. And uh, I don't know, just kind of always kind of had my hand in agriculture, came to LSU, I uh, got my master's, my PhD here, and I kind of cover a lot of different areas, but I really do a lot of work with turf and ornamentals, and that's what we're going to talk about today, how to have the best yard you ever had, and how to control some of these troublesome weeds that you might see in your yard. Can you hear me okay, Anna? We can hear you great. Um, you have really good connection right now, so it's awesome. And uh Please, y'all ask any questions you have. Ron is here, and he has brought all the weeds for y'all. Yeah, I brought a few weeds here, and I'm at Burden today, and our connection's been a little rough. We've had a tough time getting on board here, but, I, but uh, hopefully we can make it work out. Uh, so there were some questions about crabgrass. And we actually have crabgrass right here. This is crabgrass, but it's often confused with Dallas grass, which is this grass right here. Can you see this okay? Yes. So this is Dallas grass. A lot of people call Dallas grass crabgrass, but this is the most common grass that you might find in your lawn, Dallas okay. grass. It's a perennial, very deeply rooted. You just can't dig it out of the ground. Uh, you can barely dig it out of the ground. You won't be able to hand pull it, but this is the this is actually Dallas grass, and this is crabgrass. Crabgrass is an annual, and it produces a lot of seed, about 10,000 seeds per plant. And the seeds have a good bit of longevity in the soil. You might find this one in your flower beds. There are many options for controlling crabgrass in a flower bed. You can actually select it out of your, your flower bed. Since we're mainly growing broad leaves or we're, we're growing an iris or we're growing a lily, uh, controlling crabgrass in a flower bed is easily done with something like Cethoxidem as the active ingredient. And uh, Cethoxidem, you can find it un under several names. High yield grass killer would be one name. Uh, there's one called Bonide uh, Grass Beater. That's another one that's uh, very good at controlling crabgrass in a flower bed setting. So we have many options for controlling crabgrass. You can also control it pre-emergence. Herbicides like Amaze and uh, uh, Preen are very good in a flower bed setting. So a pre-emergence herbicide, something you can apply in the flower bed periodically every 60 to 90 days, depending on the product label and it pretty much keep it out of your flower bed by, by preventing it. But if you do get it in your flower bed, you can kill it with the active ingredient Cethoxidem. Garden centers will have these products. High yield grass killer, Fertilum over the top too is another product that's out there that's very, very effective. You can spray it right over your flowers. It only kills grasses, doesn't kill your flowers. So unless you have some ornamental grasses. And Liriope and Mondo grass are not, they're not grasses, they just look like grasses. So if you get crabgrass in your flower bed, you can pretty much kill it. But the problem is if you get Dallas grass in your lawn, that's very hard to kill. You might have to spot treat it out with Roundup or, or just dig it out because there's really not a lot of good options out there at the homeowner level for controlling it. This is very common in St. Augustine grass. Okay. So there's some other questions there, Anna? Uh, Crystal was just saying she's got that in her grass, in her lawn as well. Are there any organic options, Bruce is asking? Okay, so as far as organic herbicides, we have looked at some organic things. Uh, organic herbicides like, there's one called Scythe, S-C-Y-T-H-E, S-C-Y-T-H-E. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good organic option. Uh, there's also one called Burnout that they have at garden centers. These are products that you'll have at garden centers that you won't find at big box stores. But what they will do is they burn the vegetation, they burn the foliage. Uh, so this is a perennial plant that has some underground storage organs. These organic herbicides, and we've evaluated them, and there's some, there's some good ones out there, but they'll just burn the vegetation, they'll just burn the foliage, and they won't move into the root system. And that's why glyphosate is, is so effective on a perennial plant. It hits the leaves and moves into the underground parts. But I understand a lot of people want to be organic, but that's the thing with organic products is uh, they do give you a good burn, but killing the plant is another is another thing altogether because uh, it has those underground parts, those uh, underground storage organs, 
In this case, it's a rhizome that allows it to come back from all of the um, all of the burn from the herbicide. It just kind of burns the leaves. It doesn't move into the plant. So uh, organic options for that wouldn't be that wouldn't be very effective. But for crabgrass, something like a scythe or that burnout product would burn this back pretty well. It's an annual. The root system is not as well developed as this perennial plant. So you could probably burn this back. Now, this is already producing seed heads, so it's not as tender and uh, would be not as nearly as be as easily controlled as it would be if it was a lot smaller. This plant's already producing next year's crop. So you would want to catch it early if you're going to be using organic products and you'd have to direct the spray. There's no organic products that are not non-selective. They're all going to be non-selective. Okay. Uh, like, like this uh, and not hurt your flower bed too. So you got to be careful and direct your spray. So. Okay. We're seeing uh, a good bit of, of, of grasses in flower beds right now. Like uh, this is Bermuda grass. This is another perennial grass that is very, very hard to control in a flower bed setting. And that's where those grass killers I was telling you about er earlier, like high yield grass killer, fertilum over the top too, uh, that bonide grass beater product, those products that contain sethoxidem would be something that you could spray in a flower bed that would at least knock this back and with repeated applications would eventually control Bermuda grass. There's another one too called Grass Be Gone. It's a ready to use product and the active ingredients Lueza pop. And that one is actually a little bit better on Bermuda grass. It's called Grass Be Gone. It's an ortho product that will uh, hit the leaves and translocate into the plant and do a pretty good job of knocking this Bermuda grass back. Give me a grass in a flower bed any day because we're usually growing broadleaf plants. You know, we're growing flowers, plants that have broad leaves. Grasses are a completely different kind of plant. Uh, grasses are in a different family than broad leaves, and there are herbicides that will just control grasses. And I say that because it will control Bermuda grass with repeated applications, something like a grass be gone or a fertile over the top too. But I'll tell you, you get this one in the flower bed. This is torpedo grass. I would say don't look directly at the screen right now. <laughs> that invasive. Uh, that grass is awful. A problem in South Louisiana, especially. And uh, this is one right here that is like Bermuda grass on steroids. So this is Bermuda grass, and this is um, this is torpedo grass in my left hand. And uh, torpedo grass been around South Louisiana since the 1920s. And uh, it's become a huge problem. New Orleans is covered in torpedo grass. Baton Rouge is getting there. And uh, having this in your flower bed, very tough to control. The grass killers aren't that good on it. We've been able to control it with repeated applications of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, by actually painting it on the plant. Uh, a high uh, dose, uh, take a paintbrush and make a solution. And we've had good luck painting it on the plant and really getting some pretty good control. There's no single applications that's going, to, that's going to control it because of these rhizomes that you see right here. They have, uh, it allows this plant to have great recuperative potential. Uh, torpedo grass, you'll spray it, you'll think you've killed it, and then it comes right back because of these rhizomes. Uh, this is a very tough plant. It's the worst thing you can have in your flower bed or in your lawn right now. If you get this in your lawn, if it's Bermuda grass, if it's a Bermuda grass lawn or a zoysia grass lawn, we can kind of knock it back with a, a herbicide called Drive. But in St. Augustine and Centipede, I tell you, you can try Cethoxidem, which will be a uh, bonide grass feeder in Centipede grass, and you will knock it back a little bit in Centipede grass, but you won't control it. Eventually, the lawn will have to be renovated. And uh, if you renovate that lawn, it's an opportunity to really kill it. High rates of glyphosate will kill it. And, uh, and then I would switch to something like zoysia grass. And I have the grasses here. We're gonna talk about some of the grasses and how to maintain your lawn so you don't have all these weed problems. But we wanted to show the weeds first because the surefire way to kill a weed is to uh, collect it and start showing people. It starts wilting and you know, you can't, uh, it, it starts wilting, it doesn't even look like it's healthy at all. But uh, we're seeing a lot of torpedo grass out right now. A lot of Bermuda grass in flower beds. The thing is, with Bermuda grass, there are options for controlling it in a flower bed. And uh, with torpedo grass, there's really not a great option. You end up using glyphosate, which is Roundup and some generics out there, like high yield kills all is one that the garden centers carry. Very high rates, and then paintbrush it on. It's very tedious, 
but that's been the most effective way to control it. So paint brush it on because we have a couple people saying they have it in their uh, in their yards and garden beds. Selena saying we have that in southeast Texas. Please help us. Yeah, and well, yeah, well, you, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to Louisiana. We have it like crazy uh, in South Louisiana, and there's just nothing that works well on it. Um, what we have found is like. Uh, you can make a solution of high yield kills all, for instance. That's a glyphosate product, a Roundup product. An ounce and a half in 16 ounces of water, or three ounces in 32 ounces of water. And just, uh, unfortunately, the best application method is to get some gloves on, of course, and take a paintbrush and paintbrush it onto the uh, to the uh, torpedo grass. Uh, it's not going to hurt your flowers uh, because you're not hitting your flowers. But trying to spray that product in a flower bed, it's non-selective. It would kill everything out there in the flower bed, unless you can very carefully apply it. But uh, being able to make that solution, three ounces and 32 ounces of water, three ounces of that high yield kills all, it's a 41% glyphosate product. And uh, you can put that in a little uh, container and mix it up and take a paintbrush and just try to paint it on. That's about the best method that we've seen so far that where it will kill the, pro kill the, uh, kill the weed and not hurt the plants in the landscape. We do have a question from Andrea about cocoa grass. She has cocoa grass in her lawn. I think we have this here, don't we, Dave? Help me out. Uh, okay, that's a, a, actually a sedge, and uh, that's the number one weed problem in the world. Having a sedge in the flower bed, very, very common issue, common problem. Uh, number one weed problem in the world, cocoa. I, I know in North Louisiana they call purple nut sedge cocoa a lot. But a purple nut sedge, and we may look for some here in a little bit. I, actually, I see some out the corner of my eye. Uh, we, uh, that's a problem in flower beds, number one weed problem in the world. There is, uh, There are some products out there that you can use in a flower bed. You have now, to Ron, she had it in her lawn. Oh, in her lawn. Well, that yeah. changes everything. Uh, the garden centers will have um, ha a product called High Yield Nut Sedge Killer, or they may have a product called Sedge Hammer. Great name, huh? Sedge Hammer. That can be sprayed in all southern turf grass, sedge hammer or um, a, a product called high yield nut sedge killer. And uh, that product right there can be sprayed in Bermuda grass, St. Augustine, uh, pretty much any of the uh, of the uh, lawns that you have, centipede grass, St. Augustine, zoysia, Bermuda grass. You can spray that. It takes it three, about three weeks to work. But these sedge killers like high yield nut sedge killer and sedge hammer, very, very effective at killing sedges in the lawn. They can also be used in the flower bed as a directed spray. In the lawn, you can spray them pretty much indiscriminately. In a flower bed, you gotta direct your spray. Be very careful when you spray it. Very effective herbicide, takes it about three weeks to work. Very, very effective. Now, purple nut sedge or cocoa is the number one weed problem in the world. You're not gonna spray it one time and control it. It's gonna take multiple applications so get ready. You're in it for the long haul with that one. So multiple applications, uh, just get ready for it. Uh, you won't get rid of it in one, but uh, stay on top of it. She said, thank you. And we have another question from Jordan. What are products that are safe to use near citrus trees and in edible gardens? Citrus trees and edible gardens? Well, glyphosate is actually labeled. Uh, Roundup is labeled for use around citrus trees. Uh, there, of course, organic products are out there. That product I was telling you about, Scythe. Uh, let me write that on the board. Can you follow me over here, Dave? So, the glyphosate, that's Roundup. And Roundup is actually labeled for citrus, for weed control around the citrus. And, uh, but if you want to go organic, there's a product called Scythe. And that also is a product that could be used around citrus. It's a contact herbicide that, uh, you know, will give you some pretty decent control with repeated applications. So that's just a couple of options right there. There are some more professional products that could be used, but these are just some of the co a couple of uh, herbicides that are, are labeled for use in a citrus area. Uh, Bruce is asking, can the products you mentioned earlier, organic products, can they be used on vegetable gardens? Yes, they are uh, like this, that, that product that are, that's called Burnout is a 25B product, so it's not under uh, EPA regulation. It's a great smelling product. Uh, garden centers have it. Uh, burnout, it's a very high use rate, uh, but yes, it can be used in a, in a garden, in a vegetable garden, as a directed spray. 
uh, you hit your vegetables with it, it's going to burn your vegetables. So it's called burnout. Burnout. And it's organic and uh, would be something that you could, could possibly use uh, in your vegetable garden as a directed spray, of course. He's also asking, so this is going around on Facebook quite a bit. Does corn gluten meal actually work as a pre-emergent? Okay. Yes. So we have, we've, we've evaluated corn gluten meal a good bit. Uh, we've looked at it in vegetables. Um, it's a pre-emerge herbicide. It has an enzyme that tends to uh, get in the way of germination of, of some seeds. Uh, we've looked at it in flower beds also. And uh, we actually have seen some pretty decent control with it. We are, we're looking at it in blackberries right now uh, as organic weed control in blackberries. We've actually had some pretty decent control, but it is corn gluten. As it breaks down, it becomes fertilizer. And so you got to keep repeating your application. Uh, it says on the label about every 28 days. In Louisiana, it seems to be about every 14 to 21 days that you have to apply. It breaks down very quickly. Uh, and, and when it breaks down, it becomes fertilizer and it's no longer a, an herbicide. But it, it has helped some to have it, a pre-emerge pre organic herbicide. Uh, now, the thing about it, too, is in hot, humid weather, which we rarely have in Louisiana, hot, humid weather, uh, it does break down and it smells like a hog pen when it breaks down in hot, humid weather. Uh. But, but it has worked pretty well in our test plots. The uh, synthetic products are, you know, so much better. But... It is a pre-emerge herbicide that we have tested, and we have had some pretty decent results with it. It's better than the untreated check. It will hold the weeds down for a little while, uh, but about 14 days, they just kind of explode as that product breaks down. Uh, it, it becomes fertilizer, it provides nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to the soil, and, and, the, and the weeds germinate and just explode and grow after, afterwards. Fair enough. Yeah, corn we have one more from Crystal. What are your thoughts on Milo granite as a pre-emergent? Milo granite, malorganite. Oh, sorry, I had not heard of yeah, that before. It's probably malorganite. It's malorganite. A pre-emergence herbicide, but it is a, a very good uh, uh, organic uh, fertilizer. It's a nitrogen source. It's a very um, low rate nitrogen, like it's a low percentage nitrogen, so it takes a lot. It may take you 30 pounds per thousand square feet to give you a pound of nitrogen. It's like a very low use, very low percentage of nitrogen, but it does provide organic matter and it won't burn your turf. So I like it, uh, but it's not a pre-emerge herbicide. It's a, it's an organic fertilizer, a, a source of nitrogen, an organic source of nitrogen. Okay. Um, okay. Anybody else? That's what we got right now. Okay. Okay. So. So we may be um, are seeing a lot now in our flower beds. One that we see a uh, pretty good bit right now is spurge. So this is spurge. This is prostrate spurge. So it never looks right, you know, when I'm trying to show people. But spurge grows flat. This is prostrate spurge, so it grows flat. And uh, this is one that we see a lot in flower beds. When you break it open, it has this milky sap that comes out. I don't know how well y'all can see that. But this milky sap comes out. This is an annual, a broadleaf, that we try to control with pre-emerge herbicides in a flower bed setting. This, this will cover a flower bed. It grows flat. You see it in cracks of concrete all the time. Herbicides like Crane, which is a pre-emergence herbicide, and uh, Amaze. Uh, there's one called Weed Stopper. Uh, I think it's a high-yield product, Weed Stopper with Dithiopyr. These are all pretty good products, pre-emergence products. So what you would have to do is get rid of the existing plant because these products have no activity on plants that you see in the flower bed, just the existing plant, no post-emergence activity, but pre-emergence, they work pretty well. And uh, so you'd have to hand remove the existing weeds in the flower bed, sprinkle those products out, water them in. And uh, we've seen some, actually some pretty good spurge control. Now, spurge is also one of the first things that breaks the flower bed, but this is a real problem. Uh, you know, I can find it everywhere out here. It's a, a prostrate growing plant. There's also some tall growing versions of it too tall growing species. This is hyssop spurge that grows tall. They're all spurges and uh, every one of them, when you break them open, they have that milky sap that comes out. I don't know how we yes. see it. That's, uh, that's a spurge uh, and all these spurges, so they're, they're, it's a broadleaf, so there's not anything you can spray in that flower bed 
that will kill this particular plant without killing your flowers. So, but there are those pre-emerge herbicides where you'd go in and hand remove the existing plants and, uh, and then sprinkle these products out. It won't hurt your flower bed. You water them in and it creates a chemical barrier. And as those weed seeds start germinating, uh, they go into that barrier and they absorb the herbicide and it, and it kills them. It doesn't last forever. It'll last for about you know, 45 to 60 days. It starts to break down. Cats will get into the flower bed and dig around. They'll break it down. Dogs will occasionally get into the flower bed and they might uh, break that barrier down too. But uh, we really rely a lot on pre-emergence herbicides in a flower bed. Doesn't work on that cocoa, like we always talk about, that purple nut sage. Won't work on that in the flower bed. But um, it will work on some of the broad leaves that we have, like this um, purslane right here. Purslane is another broad leaf that we see in flower beds. Very succulent plant. Some people eat it. It uh, known to be pretty high in omega-3 fatty acids, so some people will eat it. Uh, but spurge and, and, and purslane in a flower bed are two very common small seeded broad leaves. And we rely again on pre-emergence herbicides like cream and uh, high yield weed stopper. And uh, Amaze is another good product that's out there too, pre-emergence. So get rid of this existing plant by hand removal, sprinkle those products out, water them in, and you'll see it will really help you with some of the some of the back breaking work that you have in a flower bed what about um i just have a question myself what about lawn burrweed we get a lot of questions on yeah. that yeah so lawn burrweed just about on its way out now because of the high temperatures lawn burrweed or sticker weed uh, lawn burrweed is a, is a broad leaf it's a low growing broad leaf it germinates in october and, uh, and then we get into February and March, and you can kind of tell it's lawn burrweed, but it still doesn't have the stickers. The stickers are actually the seed capsules. And uh, when we get into April and May, that's when we start feeling the stickers. You walk across your yard, it's like stepping on tacks. So we rely on pre-emerge pre herbicides for that one. We like atrazine in the fall. That's pretty good uh, in lawns in the fall and wintertime. But I also like another product that's at garden centers too. It's called MSM Turf. And that's a product that is labeled for use in centipede, St. Augustine, Bermuda grass, and zoysia grass. It's a very low use rate herbicide. Garden centers have it. It's MSM turf. And this is a very good herbicide. MSM turf. A very good herbicide. Uh, very, very effective on broad leaves. Very slow. Pretty good on Virginia buttonweed. Very good on lawn burrweed, good on Vespadiza. A lot of our broadleaf weeds, very good on dollar weed, which I'll show you in a second. That product right there can be applied in all southern turf grass. Very low use rate. It's like a tenth to an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon. It's a dispersible granule. Very low use rate. And you would use about a tablespoon of uh, surfactant with it in a gallon. Uh, that gallon should cover a thousand square feet. So it's a very low use rate herbicide. We've had a lot of success controlling broad leaves in the lawn. Very good on spurge when it gets in, in the lawn. Safe one, St. Augustine, centipede grass, Bermuda grass, and zoysia grass. So MSM turf, I recommend it a lot. Garden centers, many garden centers carry it. Feed stores will have it. And, uh, and, and so those are some very good products that are out there. I, I'm a big fan of the garden centers because the people there are very knowledgeable. Uh, you know, you go to some of the big box stores and they have no idea what you're talking about. And they won't have this product anyway. So um, the garden centers, you should rely, I think, on them very heavily because they have a lot of good knowledge and they always call us if they're not sure uh, about which, which product to use. So uh, I mentioned dollar. You we have a couple questions. Jordan okay. is asking, when you say we can use some of these weed killers in flower beds, is this a bulb only flower bed? Is this a bulb, bulb. bulb only? Uh, some, so many of these uh, products can be used in, with bulbs. But I'm saying, like, if you have azaleas, like if you if you pan around here, Dave, you'll see these azaleas right here, and you'll see uh, several different flowers that we have right here. Uh, there's some variety mondo grass. So, so these are these are are just typical flower beds. Pre-emergence herbicides are great fit are great fit in these flower beds uh, for annual beds. Uh, you know, something like a High yield weed stopper, uh, a maze. These are products that can be used in annual beds. Uh, and if you have bulbs, they can be used in there as long as the bulbs are not out. And uh, sometimes those bulbs will have like a whirl with their uh, leaf formation and they'll capture some of the granules. 
and you end up with some distorted flowers. So if the bulbs are in the ground or if the bulbs don't have a whirl that will catch those granules when you spread them out, then there would be definitely be a possibility to use uh, some of those granular pre-emergence herbicides in bulbs or without bulbs. Uh, I don't really worry too much about bulbs whenever um, I'm putting this in a flower bin setting as long as the bulbs aren't out. Okay. Uh, Mimi is asking, is there any good post-emergent control for poa anua? For poa anua? Anua, yep. Yeah, okay. So that's annual bluegrass. And uh, what we're seeing, that's, she's probably asking about lawns. And uh, so that's a cool season annual grass. It's kind of gone now or dying off from the, from the heat. It's a, it started germinating in September in Louisiana. And what we rely on really are pre-emergence herbicides. Uh, Pendamethalin uh, is a very good one on it. Uh, Barricade is a very good pre-emergence herbicide. Once it's up and growing, you're really a lot more limited because we're seeing a lot of resistance problems with many of the herbicides that we have out there. In St. Aug and in centipede grass, uh, and, uh, we rely pretty much on atrazine uh, early on, but there's starting to be a lot of resistance issues. But like an October, November application of atrazine, followed by a January, February application of atrazine has worked pretty well. There's a professional product called Certainty, uh, Certainty that can be used in, um, in most southern turf grasses. And uh, it's a professional product it's called Certainty. It also kills sedges, and uh, that has looked pretty good for us um, in St. Augustine, centipede grass, Bermuda grass, and zoysia grass. So it's a post-emergence herbicide. It's mainly used for sedges, but it's a professional product that also has some activity on annual bluegrass. And I've, I've had about as much good luck with that one on annual bluegrass as I have with atrazine. The problem here is you don't want it to get, you don't want the annual bluegrass, the poa, to get really tall, start seeding out. You want to catch it when it's before it seeds out. If you have a history of it, you know it might be the only green thing there in your lawn in the winter time. And so, we have had good luck with certainty. Go ahead and spray it uh, because the poa is probably there, and uh, it's been really pretty good for us actually. Uh, but there is a lot of a lot of resistance problems right now trying to control the annual bluegrass poa in a lawn setting. Okay. Um, thank you, Ron. Eric's asking about MSM turf. He said it turned his centipede grass red and stunted growth, and it looks to have even killed some of the grass above ground, and Bermuda came up in its place. Will the centipede regenerate in those areas? Okay, so you can get injury sometimes if the rate's a little high, or maybe you, you stay on an area too long, or maybe a little bit during transition. Centipede had a very hard time this winter. Uh, it didn't really go dormant, and... Uh, we had a lot of something called uh, Bermuda grass, uh, excuse me, uh, centipede grass decline, and it was really under a lot of stress. And so we saw a lot of injury from herbicides this past uh, this past spring, and really is still pretty well injured. Uh, the thing is, Bermuda grass once it gets a foothold in an area, it's hard to get it out. Uh, so centipede will likely grow back into that area, but Bermuda grass will be there with it. There is an herbicide that you can use that has some activity on Bermuda grass that centipede will tolerate. And that's that uh, bonide grass feeder. It's on the product label that it can be sprayed in centipede. It has activity on Bermuda grass. In fact, it will knock it back pretty hard. Centipede will tolerate it. So it's called bonide grass feeder. Bonide. Bonide grass feeder. And so this is one that is a grass killer. It can be applied in flower beds. It only kills grasses, but the one grass that seems to tolerate it pretty well is centipede. So it actually, it's on the product label that you can spray centipede to kill other grasses. And uh, Bermuda grass is one that would not like being sprayed with this product right here. So it will knock the Bermuda grass back. It may take a follow-up application, uh, but that is one grass that you can knock back in centipede grass. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, we have, again, we have a lot of weed issues. We have dollar weed. The dollar weed in the parsley family loves wet areas. I'm sure you've seen this before in your lawn. Now, this is a long, long growing plant right here, real tall one. It's a problem in flower beds, too. 
but uh, this is dollar weed, and dollar weed in the lawn, very, very common in Louisiana. We usually get a lot of rain. If you have any kind of drainage problems, you'll see a lot of dollar weed. And this is another one that we really like, MSM turf on it. MSM turf is very good on dollar weed. St. Aug, centipede, Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, or, or grasses that will tolerate MSM turf. And so we've been able to kind of knock it back. Some of the, some of the weed and feed products are actually decent on it. Products that contain atrazine uh, will kind of knock it back, will knock back the dollar weed pretty well. But I really like this product right here on dollar weed. Very, very good on it. So let's see what else we have. Go ahead. Did you have something else, Anna? Um, nope, nope, you're good right now. Okay, another one that we're seeing a lot of is called basket grass. This is one that you see in areas where it's just very shady. And so it's kind of a transition area. You have a St. Augustine lawn <clears throat> and it's very shady. In that area, the St. Augustine seems to be transitioning over to this. And uh, that's because basket grass, this is basket grass, basket grass is very shade tolerant. And St. Augustine reaches a point where it can't tolerate deep shade. And this grass right here will grow instead of the St. Augustine. So on your property, if you see basket grass growing, that's an area that you shouldn't even bother to sod with St. Augustine because it's just too shady. Uh, you know, you can say St. Augustine has good shade tolerance. It has decent shade tolerance, but it can't tolerate uh, being uh, under deep shade. And that's where basket grass thrives. So you'll end up with more basket grass in St. Augustine. There's no way to select this out of your St. Augustine. The only way to fix the problem is to try to get more light in that area. You know, do some trimming around on the trees. But uh, basket grass, very common in South Louisiana, North Louisiana too, in areas where uh, it's just so shady. You know, so shady, St. Augustine won't grow there. So that's basket grass. Uh, sure we got y'all have this uh, in, your, in your backyards or under shade trees. Areas where the St. Augustine just isn't performing very well, but you'll see this kind of, it doesn't even look like a grass. It's kind of a broadleaf look to it, but it's a true grass that just, just loves the shade. It can't tolerate sunlight, and so if you can get more light into that area, it will give a competitive advantage to the St. Augustine grass. So uh, we always say these grasses, St. Augustine, Georgia, are real shade tolerant, and they are pretty shade tolerant, but in deep shade, uh, it's just nothing's going to grow very well there that's going to be worthy of calling a lawn. So, so we'll see a lot of uh, uh, basket grass in those areas. Now, I mentioned buttonweed earlier, and buttonweed is out like crazy, and sure enough, you collect it and it starts wilting on you. But look for these buttons right here. I don't know how well you can see it. Those are seed capsules, and uh, there are two seed in each capsule. But this is a perennial plant. makes those white flowers all over your yard. And that's another one that that MSM turf is actually pretty good on it with repeated applications. MSM turf, which I showed you earlier, for buttonweed. Pretty good option for buttonweed. Uh, that's what we've seen in, in trials over the years. There's no 100% perfect option for buttonweed. It's, um, it's something that we see a lot of in lawns this time of the year. By the time September and October come around, they're just, it's just huge. You know, it's just mat forming. It actually kills your grass. So get on top of Virginia buttonweed that number one weed problem in southern turf grass. MSM turf, repeated applications work pretty well. I really actually like starting out early, like in April. It emerges early, the perennial plant. And I like a product called uh, Weed Free Zone for that. Fertilone Weed Free Zone garden centers will have that. You can spot treat it in April. And then uh, if it gets too hot and you get too much damage on your lawn, that's when we start switching over to MSM turf or another product called Celsius. Celsius is also pretty good. And that would be another product that you could use in the lawn called Celsius. That's another product that's pretty good on Virginia buttonweed and can be used in all southern turf except Bahia grass and it can be and, and it can't be used in carpet grass. But Celsius is also pretty good on buttonweed and MSM turf is very good on buttonweed as well. So we have a question, Ron, from Eric again about the MSM turf. He had the centipede turn red. He said, should I consider resodding the centipede that went into decline, or do you think it will reemerge? Okay. Uh, what we see is a lot of that centipede recovers this month after we get the warm temperatures and the heat. Uh, centipede decline, usually there's a, a thatch problem, and thatch is a lot of organic matter. It makes your lawn real puffy, and centipede's real prone to that. 
centipede is the least tolerant grass. We actually have centipede over here. So Dave, like Dave's doing a good job with the camera here. So this is centipede grass right here, kind of a pale green grass. And, uh, and centipede grass is the least tolerant, the least tolerant grass of wet conditions. And if it gets a thatch problem, that will stay really, really too wet all winter long and it'll just die off from that. And uh, usually what we see is by June, it's recovered and growing into those areas. But we were so cool in May that it didn't recover very well. And I got lots of calls about centipede grass. So it's really, um, if, it's, if it's just very thin, still looks really, really bad, you may have to resod those areas. Uh, but if it seems to be growing back in, you see some green areas in those dead spots, I would probably give it another couple of weeks and kind of see where you are. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of centipede, especially this year, because of all of its issues. It has that thatch problem. It's it real puffy, and uh, it just seems to die off in the wintertime, and then we have to grow it back in. does not handle wet feet. doesn't like poor drainage, the least tolerant of poor drainage. So that's something to consider. If you've got a lawn that has poor drainage, I know in the Baton Rouge area, we also have very high pH soils. So uh, we uh, it's just... It's not a perfect fit everywhere. It's the, the cheapest lawn to, to buy a sod, but it's just not a perfect fit everywhere. And uh, especially if you have drainage problems, it's just, I'm just not a huge fan of it. It's moderately shade tolerant, won't tolerate deep shade at all. I, in full sun, I probably would put it in full sun. But it, for, to answer your question, it's all about, if you see a lot of green areas in that centipede uh, that's kind of knocked back, if you see a lot of green, likely it will recover. If you have a lot of thatch problems, uh, there's a very good chance that it's, you're going to be right back in that same problem next year. So you probably would be better off to cut it out and just resod it. Yep. Brown, I got to ask you, um, yeah. what turf do you grow in your lawn? Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm a, a I'm a big fan of zoysia grass. And my front yard is zoysia, and that's this grass right here. And that's not a great sample, but this is zoysia grass. Zorge grass is a very tough sod. You can see it's kind of a darker green color than the centipede. Very tough sod. So, so centipede grass, centipede grass and St. Augustine grass essentially just run on top of the, of the ground. They've got uh, something called stolons, which are just runners that run on top of the ground and roots down. Zorge grass and Bermuda grass run on top of the ground and under the ground uh, with rhizomes. So they have great wear tolerance, great drought tolerance. So this is what I have in my front yard. I never have any problems with it. I fertilize it once, twice a year, and uh, I just never have any problems. It's so tight, I don't have a lot of weed problems in it. I cut it short, cut it about an inch, inch and a half. Uh, we have a lot of sod growers in our state that grow zoysia grass. My favorite, one of my favorites is Palisade zoysia. Palisade is just a variety of zoysia, and uh, it's looked good in, in shady areas, not deep shade, but shady areas. A very tough grass. Uh, doesn't feel as good to you uh, when you walk barefoot. Now this is St. Augustine right here. You walk barefoot on St. Augustine, it feels really good to your feet, nice and soft. To me, the zoysia feels a little more prickly to your feet when you're barefoot. Uh, kind of like acupuncture when you walk across the pain. <laughs> but uh, I always tell people you get used to the pain eventually. But it's, um, it's a very good tough sod, zoysia grass. And I have few problems with it. I have centipede on my side yards. I have good drainage, so I don't have any problems with the centipede. My backyard, just don't ever go back there. It's kind of a mix of everything because I have dogs back there and I raised a sack full of kids too, and they kind of wore that backyard out. Uh, so backyard is probably Bermuda grass mix, but zoysia to me has not been a problem at all. It's been a great, great turf for my front yard. Centipede on the side yards, no issue at all. I cut it short. I cut the centipede short. That's another thing we want to do with centipede. We often treat centipede like it's uh, like it's St. Augustine. It needs to be cut shorter. And if you're cutting it tall, bring it down slowly over a month or two. Bring that mowing height down to an inch or an inch and a half. But we want to cut it a lot shorter, probably than people are cutting their centipede grass lawn. You wouldn't do it all at once. You'd bring it down slowly over a you know, the next six weeks or so. Just bring the mowing height down and you'll see that it improves it over time. So uh, centipede, fertilized centipede maybe once, maybe twice per, per growing season. I like April and I like maybe June for that second application. The second application is optional because with centipede grass, you can overdo it with fertilizer and that will also lead to centipede grass decline, overdoing the fertilizer. 
with uh, with zoysia grass. I fertilize zoysia usually in late April because it's very slow to come out of dormancy, and I might fertilize this again in July. Uh, this is not a great sample right here. It needs to be cut a little bit shorter. It's also showing some seed heads. A lot of these plants, when they show seed heads, that means they're going through some type of stress. So uh, this one right here is showing that it's got some seed heads, maybe a little compacted soil or something there. Uh, St. Augustine grass, in order to keep it growing well, uh, you gotta take care of it. You, you fertilize St. Augustine two to three times per year. I like April, June, and August, if you do three times, if it needs that third application to really get it going. And I mow it at three inches. With St. Augustine, fertilizer, mowing it at three inches, it's still gonna have a lot of problems with insects and diseases but we just keep it as healthy as possible. It goes through a lot of issues. Large patch disease, chinch bugs will hit it in hot, dry summertime. But we're talking about weed management, and when it comes to the lawn, it's managing that lawn correctly. With St. Augustine, mow it at three inches, fertilize it two to three times per year, and uh, don't let it get stressed. Uh, what we're seeing a lot of too is, we have a lot of clay in this state. The soils are clay. They become very compacted. And aerating that soil will really get that grass growing. It's like if you've ever had a garden, when you plow a garden, or when you hoe around your vegetables, how it really improves their look and they start picking up and looking better. Getting more oxygen in the soil, loosening that soil up. Um, irrigation works a lot better when you've aerified, you've aerated, and you get some channels for the water to go down through the soil profile. So um, when it comes to managing the lawn, it's fertilizing it appropriately, it's mowing it appropriately. And uh, there are also some stresses that, you, that the lawn will go through during the year. And compacted soil is a big stress. Uh, there are places you can rent aerators. There are pool types that are probably not quite as effective as the, the rental types with an engine. But we've seen lawns just really improve from just being aerated. Uh, compacted soil is a big problem. Some questions, Anna? Um, we had one from Crystal on, um, she had dry patches, circular patches in her in her St. Aug. She tested for chinch bugs, but not seen any in her sample spots. How can she stop the spots? Yeah, well, it's a little early for chinch bugs. And if you're seeing some really dry areas, she may have fairy ring fungus or something like that. Um, those areas that have, this, there's a type of fairy ring, I think it's a type one fairy ring, that is um, very, very uh, tough on the lawn. It's some organic matter may be very deep in the soil uh, that you won't be able to possibly probably treat with a, um, with a fungicide very effectively. But that's an area where they could be aerated that uh, you could poke some holes. I know in my, at my house, I have a, uh, a garden fork that is really, really thick tines that you can punch in the soil and, and get some channels for the water to go down through the profile. That will help. But those areas are very hydrophobic where you have a lot of that uh, issue with uh, fairy ring fungus. Uh, fungicides will help a little bit if they can be drenched in there. But, but that's a fungus that's very deep in the soil. There could have been a tree buried when they built that lot. Something in there that those fungus are feed, the fungi are feeding on and uh, hardly anything you can do about it. So keeping that area moist, uh, uh, aerifying it as often as you possibly can seems to help, uh, but it's, it's really tough. There's also some surfactants that you can buy called wetting agents that some of the professional stores have that you can spray on those areas that seem to reduce the surface tension and allows water to go down through the profile of the soil. But that's probably a fairy ring fungus and it's very hard to deal with. Very hard to deal with. Marina is asking, do you prefer mechanical or liquid aeration? I prefer mechanical just because of the availability of it. Um, you know, it's for, for at the homeowner level, uh, those uh, aerators you can go rent, uh, they're pretty effective. They're all, I really like, there's something called an Air 2G2 that actually shoots air in the soil. I really like that. There's very little surface disruption. But anything that will break that soil up a little bit uh, and create channels and, and uh, will, you know, will, will cause that soil to loosen up, that's going to help you when it comes to getting moisture into the profile. And also, uh, it helps the fertilizer get into the soil. I know phosphorus, that middle number on a fertilizer bag, is not something that travels through the soil very well. But if you can get some channels through an aerator, you know, that really helps. So I prefer a mechanical aerator just because of the availability. Fair enough. Do you have any recommendations, Ron, on like publications that um, 
you know, everyone can go to for the Ag Center. Yeah, or where yeah, you can we have a, something called the Louisiana Lawn Series, um, Home Lawn Series. And you'll see a lot of information on that about St. Augustine centipede. Also, many of the top weed problems that you have in, in a uh, turf setting, you will um, you'll see that, that you can download some uh, little uh, uh, little sheets on different weeds that you may have in your lawn too. So it's they're pretty effective. Uh, they've been really pretty popular. And um, but it's on our website lsuagcenter.com. Uh, I just put it in the comments for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And so you could do keyword uh, Louisiana Lawn Series, and you can you'll find there's a ton of insects uh, information on insects in the lawn and diseases in the lawn weeds we have a lot of ha uh, handouts for that and also how to take care of the lawn too it's all in there um, a lot of good information on the site our turf grass site too is up too now i think so yeah way to, to really we have another another question and of course you can email um, me if you have questions i'm happy to answer emails okay i'll add that to the comments too we have a question about um larry has a horse pasture that saint augustine has crept into from the neighbors, what's the best way to get rid of it and get the Bermuda grass back? Well, uh, there's a product called uh, Pastora that you can spray uh, that's only labeled for Bermuda grass, uh, kills Bahia grass, and also kills, uh, it knocks back uh, St. Augustine pretty well too. So it's called Pastora and uh, it's labeled for pastures. It's uh, in that $25 per acre range, <clears throat> 1.25 ounces per acre broadcast treatment and that has worked pretty well at knocking back unwanted grasses and it, it may take a couple of applications on St. Augustine. Uh, it's a uh, St. Augustine can be very invasive. Uh, I don't think cows and horses like raising it very much. So we see centipede getting into horse pastures too. Uh, so uh, if it's if it's Bermuda grass you do have that pastora option. It is a labeled treatment. Repeated applications of that will, will knock back the St. Augustine grass. Okay. Don't you overgraze to, if you overgraze the Bermuda grass, that's going to give a competitive advantage to the St. Augustine. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else um, you want to add, Ron? Well, just kind of looking around here, uh, we uh, we do have some things that are coming out pretty well. I know this is uh, this is something that we see a lot of. This is called Thanks. chamber bitter. And it, no makes little, well. it makes these little balls. Uh, underneath the plant, um, the leaves, and those are seed capsules. There's about six seed in each capsule. And uh, that right there is a, a huge problem in flower beds. There's no great option. We, we rely on pre-emergence herbicides. I know a Snapshot is, is pretty good. That's a, more of a professional product. There's also uh, pre and extended control is kind of a half the rate type of product that's a Snapshot product. Uh, but this one's one you wanna keep hand pulled. Don't allow it to produce seeds. Don't allow those, those the seed capsules to mature. And we see a lot of this in um, in flower beds this time of the year. It's the summer annual uh, broadleaf. It's, it's native of Vietnam. Probably in the last 20 years, it's just exploded in flower beds. It gets really tall, makes those balls underneath the leaves. I don't know how well you can see it here. Makes those balls. Here's one right here, Dave. Makes these balls underneath the leaves and six seed in each ball. Tremendous seed producer, and we see this a lot in flower beds. Keep it hand pulled, good thick mulch helps too. They really appreciate, people are saying they really appreciate all the weed samples to see, like to identify the difference. Good, good, I'm hoping they're seeing it okay. Yeah, we can see it really well. Good, good. Yeah. Well, uh, Dave, if I'm missing anything. I've got a pig weed over there. Yeah, so we do have a pig weed too. You know, there's a lot of different weeds here. So we have a pig weed, pig weed is, um, something that we see a lot in vegetable gardens uh, and it's uh it's one you, there are products you can apply in a vegetable garden it's a synthetic product it's called treflan or trifluralin and that's pretty good on pigweed pre-emergence pigweed is a tremendous seed producer it makes about a million seeds per plant it's a broad leaf and uh it's also edible you know it's an edible thing i think the indians uh, native americans used to make a flower out of the seed. So it's a, it, there's some good things about this plant, but it's a tremendous seed producer and highly, highly invasive. Uh, so you might see this one in a vegetable garden. So I think that's pretty much it, Dave, unless you can think of something else. Dave's my cameraman here and also my research associate, and he's responsible for all these good shots of the weeds. Y'all are awesome. Appreciate all that. Um, we're, 
We have people offering their lawns if you ever want to stop by for free weed samples. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, many of the weeds that you see here I brought from my house. Some Several, several weeds I brought from my house. So uh, my backyard is a mess, like everybody else's, you know. But it's really a, the, the front yard and the side yards. It's all about how you maintain the yard with your St. Augustine and centipede grass. You have to be a little bit more meticulous, I think, with the maintenance, especially for St. Augustine. With centipede, you might want to just back off a little bit, cut it a little bit shorter, and then try to improve your drainage. And that's going to seem to that's going to help centipede grass. Okay, thank you. And guys, uh, I did put the lawn series into the comments, so you can see it below. There's a link to that. And we have a question from Cynthia for me. Um, is this going to be posted on the LSU Ag Center YouTube channel so we can see it again? We are working to get all the live series, live at five series posted to our YouTube channel for the Ag Center, but also the videos are always posted on our Facebook channel as well. So it, they're always there even after the live stream ends. So y'all can go back and under the video category, you'll be able to watch it. So they're always available to y'all. Um, Ron, do you have any last words for us? We appreciate your time. Well, everybody stay safe and hopefully we'll eventually be able to get together again. You can come to some of my talks and um, I know. happy to have you. Uh, any questions, you can email me at uh, rstrahan at agcenter.lsu.edu. You can go ahead and put that in there uh, to Anna. I, I actually there. already did, and I meant to say that earlier. I put Ron's email in there, and we actually have a few more questions that just popped up, Ron. They don't okay. want to lose you yet. Um, okay. We have one from Fran asking, can torpedo grass spread from the lawnmower? Okay, the question is, can torpedo spread from the lawnmower? And it can, it can. So um, this is torpedo grass. See the rhizomes right here? Torpedo grass does produce seed, but believe it or not, the seeds aren't viable. It solely reproduces by parts, you know, like a lawnmower coming through and cutting it, it falls into the flower bed, finds a way to root, or these rhizomes will also uh, crawl into the flower bed. But yes, you can spread it, into, especially into a flower bed, just by cutting the lawn uh -huh, and spread it around the lawn. Don't worry about the seeds. The seeds that it produces are not viable. It solely reproduces vegetatively from these rhizomes, these underground stems, and also from stems that are above ground. If they're, you know, some of these areas where you see a lot of uh, leaf material here, those are areas where potentially roots could be formed. And uh, yes, it could definitely spread just from mowing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one from Lance asking, what are your thoughts on mixing Trinexapac with Formosulfuron? Need to clean up some poa in Bermuda, but ready for a PGR. What's the, what's the uh, what's the what's the herbicide? Um, it was Trinexapac with yeah, that's a growth regulator. Okay, with for, for, for sulfuron. Chlor sulfuron. Ah, uh, it's it's with an F. Forma. Okay, let me take a look here. Foram oh foram sulfuron. Okay. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, Years ago, I've looked at some of these these uh, these uh, growth regulators. Uh, that's Primo uh, tank mix with Paramsulfuron, and and I'm okay with it. I haven't seen like crazy over the top control. What we're seeing with products like Paramsulfuron, the uh, the herbicide portion of that, we're seeing so much resistance right now with uh, with these Paramsulfuron, Trifloxysulfuron, the sulfonylureas. We're seeing just really poor control. It's crazy. You're trying to control annual bluegrass, you'll kill one, and right beside it, inches away, it's like you never even sprayed it. You know, so there's a lot of resistance problems out there in the annual bluegrass. So I like the using a, a growth regulator to kind of knock the seed heads back a little bit, but the control part is where we're really having issues with. You know, we're really seeing some issues through the years with a lot of resistance to these herbicides. So you might can knock the seed heads back for a little while. But we're seeing that a lot of recovery from the herbicide portion of that. Fair enough. And we had we had one on uh, fungus. I don't know if you want to get into that, but what do you recommend for an all-around fungus treatment for lawns? Okay. Well, there's a. Let's see if I can get over here and write it. There's a, a really good broad spectrum fungicide, and it's called. Uh, I guess I'm putting all my markers over here. It's called the active ingredient is a zoxy. Strobin, and a trade name is Heritage. That's a good all-around fungicide, trade name Heritage, but it's now generic, so you may be able to find it 
as a generic, but this is another one that's going to be more of a professional product, but that's, that is available. I don't know if the garden centers have it yet, but it's a very good, you know, try a garden center. Uh, that active ingredient has been really good and broad spectrum on uh, things like large patch, which used to be called brown patch, but it's called large patch now. Uh, gray leaf spot, you know, a lot of things that hit St. Augustine, it's going to be very good on that centipede grass uh, fungal issues, Bermuda grass fungal issues. That's a good broad spectrum fungicide. We're seeing resistance with, it, with these products too, the control uh, fungi, we're seeing resistance too. It's, resistance is just part of nature, you know, it's, you're going to eventually reach the point where we can't control hardly anything at the rate we're going. But, so yeah. that's, that's a pretty good uh, fungicide right there. Well, thank you. Um, we like the whiteboard. Really appreciate the whiteboard. Well, I almost didn't get it, but uh, we, uh, we try to pull it off somehow. It's uh, hard to move around. I don't know if y'all can follow me very well. Oh, no. You look very official. We appreciate that. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for being on. And uh, again, guys, Ron's email address is in the comments, along with the lawn series that you can find online through the Ag Center. And, um, you know, thanks. Thanks, Ron. We appreciate everything. Yeah. Hopefully in the fall, we'll have the Tigers back. And uh, I know they're redoing the stadium. Oh. Uh, the stadium a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's coming on and it'll be beautiful. And hopefully we'll be back there cheering for the Tigers this year. Amen. I'm glad you mentioned that because I've been filming the whole process of them redoing the stadium renovation. Yeah. So uh, we're putting it together and we're going to debut it in August. So y'all be on Very the lookout good. for it. It's going to be great. It needed renovation. We have great turf grass managers there at LSU. And so it's going to be beautiful. And uh, hopefully we'll be there. Hopefully we'll be there to bring Texas down. For a little oh, little oh little yeah. Little, so to speak. Go Tigers. Um, Go Tigers. But uh, thank you, Ron. And um, guys, next Monday, we're going to do another live at five with um, Heather Kirk Ballard and Winnie. And those two are going to be awesome. They're going to talk about hurricanes, COVID-19, and, you know, how to um, how to get your lawn ready and things like that for hurricane season. So thank you, Ron. Y'all have a good one. Thank you.